I'm happy to welcome you to this conference session, Talking with Your Children About Cancer. We'd like to thank Sutro Biopharma for making this session possible. A diagnosis of cancer can be overwhelming and often confusing to explain to loved ones. It can especially be challenging to find the words to clearly explain what is happening to your children, whether they are school-aged or adults. Tracy Moore and Nancy Sincata are here to help you navigate these conversations. Tracy Moore is an oncology social worker with 30 years experience as an organizational leader, patient advocate, author, and speaker. She began working with OCRA in 2018 as a consultant and in 2022 joined us full-time as our Vice President of Support and Education. Nancy Sincata is a consultant to OCRA and serves as our Director of Social Work Education and Research. Nancy has more than 40 years in oncology social work and is a psychosocial consultant for 15 oncology programs nationwide. She's worked in nonprofit, hospital, and higher education settings. I'll now turn it over to them. Hi, welcome to Talking With Your Children About Cancer. I'm Tracy. And I'm Nancy. And how to explain cancer and treatment to your child? is not always the easiest thing, but we want to demystify it and give you some ideas and some strategies to help make it easier. Um, but Nancy, what do you think? How, how do you want to explain to a child what is cancer? Well, I think it's actually a really complicated question, right? Because as a parent, when you're diagnosed with cancer, you have your own emotional reaction to being diagnosed and you continue to be the parent of your child or children. So there is some craziness about thinking that you're going to be able to deal with your own response and then be able to gain your composure and deal with, you know, your best ability as a parent to explain this thing that is new and scary and frightening to you, to your child. Sometimes it, the tasks seem so daunting that you think you shouldn't explain it to your child, right? That you should perhaps not have these conversations and in some ways just go about life and your child might not even notice because you might go to treatment and they won't be present and you'll, you know, be back home by dinner time or whatever that way that you convince yourself that it would be easier and safer um, to not say anything. And I think that feeling combined with the innate parental desire to protect your child and to protect your child from difficult information sometimes um, has people either slow down the process of telling their children or completely not tell their children. The problem with that um, approach is that children are really, really smart and that they hear everything, they see everything, so that you may think that you are protecting your child, but in fact, your child will be picking up like the feeling in the household, the conversations you have on the phone with other people. If your child is old enough to be on the internet, they may hear you say the name of something or the name of a medication, or they may see a medication bottle and begin to look up and explore what's going on. And even though it may seem like that's not, excuse me, not happening in your household, it is amazing how much that does happen and how much children really do over here. So rather than protecting your children, Sometimes by not telling them, you're giving them a message that there's a reason to hide this. And you're also not giving them the benefit of your wisdom, care, warmth, love as a parent in how you tell them, how you give them information, how you give them information that you know they will understand. So you, if you leave it to just that ambient way of learning about it, you sometimes create a situation that is more frightening for a child and you begin to give the suggestion that this is not something we can talk about. And I think that that's a hard message sometimes to undo after you've given that message. But now going to your question, Tracy, is how do you explain it to children? Like, what do you say cancer is, right? 
and and how do you do that in a way that it is understood by your child right and i i think we think about all the different ways that people talk about cancer being you know we might say it's a proliferation of cells that get out of control does a child who is six understand that not necessarily right but if you say to them you know if you think about the bathtub right and you think about filling up the bathtub with water and you don't turn the water off what happens is that the water flows outside of the tub right and that's a little bit of an explanation of some of what cancer cells can do right mm -hmm. they can go to places where they don't belong how else would you describe cancer to a child tracy i think it really depends on their age because um it can be very confusing if you use words like um mommy has a boo-boo, it can also then create some anxiety when your child has a boo-boo in the, in the next. So sometimes using language or analogies, um, you want to be really careful with how you use those. Because when explaining, I think sometimes I've used words, depending upon their age again, um, one of the cells is doing a job, um, it is not able to do its job, but it's growing and making new um, cells multiplying so that they are now a cluster of cells that are not doing the job. So we're going to give it strong medicine, different medicine than you've taken and different medicine that you've known to make that um those bad cells go away um and that you might see that i'm not feeling well or um the medicine's making me sick but hopefully it's also making those bad cells go away i think sometimes those are there's a, are some ways i actually like to draw pictures mm -hmm. and have the kids work with art Nancy, have you done that as well? Done art artwork around what a cell might look like and what it might be doing and how it might be growing and, and watch the kids kind of develop what their idea is? Yeah, again, I, I think that depending on the age of a child, using drawing to depict it or, you know, there are a number of video games out that mm -hmm. um, will show different things kind of killing cancer cells. I think that sometimes that analogy of good cells and bad cells is a really good one because just the simple concept of thinking that you want the good cells to survive and the bad cells to go away, that that's a, a helpful way of explaining it. And again, it depends on the age of a child, the aptitude, like, so not just their age, but like, what have they taken in school? What are they like? Are, is it a science minded kid? Or is it a kid who really doesn't have any um, sense of different functions of parts of the body? So I think that like you you start with good cell, bad cell, and then continue. There's also a lot of um, tools out there where you can buy a good cell and a bad cell, or you can you know buy different things that allow for that. And you know if you're you're drawing, the other good thing is that there are other activities that you you know, mm -hmm. as a parent could complement that drawing with, like in talking about um, different things or to draw, you know, even like having kids draw a picture of their family mm -hmm. um, will give a parent like a good idea of what they're thinking about as it relates to what they understand about medications, about the hospital, about um, different different experiences like that so yeah i think that um sometimes it's really like within the context of your household and your child you will think about things that you can make analogies to and to reiterate what you said to be um clear about not creating analogies or metaphors that could then frighten your child later on right like if you think about um if say you have to have a scan and right. you tell your child, you know, that you're going to be um, put to sleep for the scan, then it, it may raise issues about sleep 
for your child or you know like sometimes as an adult you might say i'm going to go have my blood drawn and there's always the question of like what does that mean and for a kid they might think well how much blood are they taking are they taking all of your blood and so i think there's things like that to to be very specific about what you're telling your children and again sometimes it's hard to understand that you may not feel sick or be sick but you're going to go and you're going to get medication that's going to make you sick and that's not your cancer that's making you sick that's the treatment that's making you sick and so i think that's also something that's really really helpful for children to understand particularly as it relates to either kind of radiation treatments or things that will make you tired because really for most children it's the things that make you less available to them that are the things that they pay attention to right so if you normally um go and play catch with them after school or if you go swimming with them and then that's something that you cannot do it's important for them to understand that the treatment that you're getting is making you tired or making you sick and that it's not that you don't love them and you don't want to be doing that with them but also that it's not the illness that is making you sick it's the, it's what you're getting to help you have the illness go away and that's a hard concept it's a hard concept for adults to understand well and it also triggers the the concept for me it's not always um what you're telling your children it's also what they've heard in school their friends talking about so if you use a very specific word like i'm going to have chemotherapy and it's going to make the bad cells go away it might make me feel sick but you know in the end the goal is to make me all better right but you don't know if their your child's best friend had an elderly relative who had had chemotherapy and maybe had a very different type of cancer and a different outcome so you don't know what that word means to your child um until you really check in with your child like how have they ever heard that word um what experiences they've had and really what does it mean to them i i always am so fascinated to see how children as nancy said are so so smart and they're processing and they're trying to figure things out i like to check in with them to see what they understood um your explanation to be and to see what they really so like it it does two things one it gives you the ability to check in but two it also opens the the opportunity for you always to have a dialogue always to have that communication of um you can ask any questions i'll explain it openly and honestly to the best of my ability um sometimes even hospitals will encourage you to schedule an appointment with a child life specialist and yourself to do some medical role play and to really make sure your child has a great understanding of what's going on and has the the confidence to be able to ask real questions at any time now this sounds somewhat like doable while we're talking about it but it really means that as a parent you will have to make a commitment to wanting to have the open communication to be in the dialogue to check in to want to pursue it and sometimes if you're a parent going through treatment the last thing you want to do is sit and talk about it you know you might want to you're coming home from treatment you might be exhausted you want to go to sleep it so mm -hmm. it's kind of an interesting thing to think about how how you create a space and the time to have such communication and it's almost easier if you create a pattern to it right like if you say on Tuesdays at 6 we're going to go for ice cream and then you know that during that walk to ice cream you're going to talk about certain things or you're going to ask certain questions so that you don't have to think every minute I'm going to do this but you kind of create a plan for yourself where you it affords you the time and the space and in a way it prepares you as well because this is we don't want you to think that this is easy because it's not it's not easy but there are these things that you can do to make it easier 
It's also interesting. Sometimes you can do an activity with a child where you ask them to draw cancer Mm -hmm. and what they draw will be very revealing in what they think. Or you ask them for one word to describe what they think cancer is. There's also like the other thoughts about like, what do you protect children from? Right. Like you do not have to tell children everything that you know about everything in your cancer experience. You need to give them the basic information and you need to answer their questions. And I think sometimes um, parents may fear that children are going to ask them questions that they can't answer. So some of the rules to that are a you can always say to your child, I don't know the answer to that, but let me talk to the doctor and we'll get back to you or let us talk to the doctor. Also, um, the other thought would be is to really, really listen to the questions that children are asking, right? Like you want to answer the questions they are asking, not the worries that you have because they do not need to be burdened by everything that you're thinking, but they do need to get answers to the things that they're asking and to answer in an efficient and age appropriate way so that you are not creating more stress because you're creating a concept that they can't understand or they can't make sense of. And I think that children are often very, very satisfied with concise, clear answers. And then they'll go on to something else. And it's not strange at all that they go on to something else once they have the information they have. And generally, children do not ask you questions beyond your tolerance or competence, right? It would be the rare child who would ask you more things than you know or that you could answer or just even more questions than you can answer. Because generally in these conversations, children have an agenda and it's about something they heard and something they learned. It it goes with what Tracy was saying a minute ago. You know, there was a period in time where one of the popes had leukemia and was not doing well. And so it was on the news and children would hear that. And so they would think if they heard that somebody else had had leukemia or somebody else had cancer, that that person was not going to do well because the repeated thing they heard was from television about somebody who was not doing well. So it really, really does make sense to check in with them, to understand what they understand even before you begin to tell them about your own condition. The other thing to understand is that children are really pretty compassionate. So they mm-hmm. are interested in how you're doing and they want to be connected. And in in many ways, they really appreciate being part of the dialogue. And I think actually you know, just being able to visit where you go and get treatment to understand the language and to understand the place and the space where cancer brings you. So I think that those are helpful things to think about. And sometimes those are the things that people really think about avoiding, but I think that it it eases, you know, what children fantasize is often much worse than what reality is. So, you know, their envisioning of a situation may be much more complicated, right? It's the same reason why if a child is worried that there's a monster in the closet or a monster under the bed, that you look under the bed with them or you go into the closet with them. It's like you bring them to the thing that they're creating an image about so that they can, again, place that image in a controlled, safe space. Um, It's also very helpful if you are really feeling sick during treatment that you begin to identify other people in your life who can be really helpful and who speak the same language about the illness as you do, right? So that you could have somebody who would, you know, take them out to lunch on a day that you're not really feeling well and be able to say to them, you know, this is the medication that's making your mom sick. um, But she's really concerned that you still have a good day today. And that's why we are going out you know, so that you're always in the child's mind, you remain in the parent role. But you may have people who help enact things that you are interested in. Does that make sense, Tracy? No, it really does. I think it's so important for the kids to have as much of a routine as possible. 
But even within that routine, routines can change, but you are, as the parent, creating an environment um, of a trusting person that they will always go to in your stead, right? And in your place, but still remain in that parent role. I also think, you know, coming back to something you said earlier, Nancy, children imagining things um, in a much more scary way than than the reality may be. I, I think about some of the kids that we've worked with who have said, you know, I was afraid that it was my fault that um, my mom got cancer or um, maybe it's contagious or maybe it's um, if I'm really, really good, it'll go away. And that's sometimes that's really helpful to almost name it, almost like going into the closet to check for the monster. Name it, demystify it. And um, reassure your child that this is this is n- none of those things, right? And not their their role to to own. On the other hand, to be able to bring them into the treatment process is really really helpful. I think about um, sometimes if 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 you do lose your hair from chemotherapy. Um, some children are really afraid to ask questions, but it can be helpful to bring them into the process and to um, trust them to um, touch your head or do um, activities. But I say that knowing that um, it has to be what works for you also, because this is emotional for you as you go through that experience. So balancing your needs and theirs can be critical. Have you had that experience, Nancy, where kids have been brought in? I've had an experience where um, a mother did not want to tell her son that she was getting chemotherapy or that she was going to lose her hair. So she got a wig and she thought she was hiding it from him. But in fact, he was very aware that she had lost her hair and he thought that she was dying because she lost her hair. And in fact, she was not dying. She was just going through like the first stage of an induction um, program. And, you know, she is to this day fine, but it was really frightening for him because he was aware of what was going on. And that goes back to, you know, we can prepare children for what's going to happen. And even though it may feel uncomfortable to prepare them, preparing them helps them emotionally about kind of their own mental health outcomes in the future, right? Because not only does it give them an an opportunity to hear what's going to happen, to react to what's going to happen, and then to see what happens. And that's kind of how kids learn things. It's probably how adults learn things as well. But it's really, you know, children can benefit from being able to master the situation and to be prepared before the situation happens and then be able to kind of participate in it. Like, you know, one child, you know, got a hat for their mother because they knew that she was going to lose her hair. And then sometimes kids will get like, you know, matching hats for themselves and their parent because then they can be part of it or people in the house will decide, oh, we're all going to do something with our hair or shave our heads so that we can be seen in unity, but by not preparing them and not telling them and not talking to them, you don't allow them to have an opportunity to participate and to be helpful in a way that they perceive that they can be helpful. So I think all of those things really um, make a big difference. And I think it is really helpful for a child to understand that they in no way caused or are responsible for this. So to reiterate, what you said, Tristan, because sometimes, you know, like a child will have a fight with a parent or somebody else in the family and they'll have these thoughts of like, you know, I wish, you know, it, it's not completely uncommon for a child to have a wish that says like, I wish you were dead. And then they see that somebody gets sick or has something going on and they feel like it was their wish that made the person sick. And they're not likely to talk to you about that because they feel responsible, guilty and all those things. So. I think it's also helpful when you can to think about like what the climate in the household was before the diagnosis and things that were going on and actually connect the dots 
for children because they don't always connect the dots again, depending on um, what age they are. I also think that children think a lot about when they hear this news or they see that someone is sick or they see someone has no energy. Children are by design very narcissistic because that's kind of how they survive and how they grow. So they do have the worry of like, what's going to happen to me in this? Who's going to take care of me while you get treatment? And and they need to have some of those concrete questions answered as well. Like what's their role going to be? How is their schedule going to change? Who's going to pick them up from school? Who's going to help them with homework? Like the things that are very unique to a child's world. And Again, depending on the age of the child and the roles in the family, it could be that this is the first time, you know, a parent is not dropping a child off at school or picking up a child at school or not being able to attend, you know, uh, a dance performance or not being able to be available, you know, to have a play date at the house. So that those kinds of things, which are the fabric of a child's world, need to be thought about and explained in ways that the child can understand so that they're not feeling kind of also consistently disappointed. And then the things that you are able to do, that you begin to think about the things you are able to do and able to engage them in so that they also have things to look forward to and things that replace some of the things um, that they have lost. You know, I know um, one family that did a lot of baking together because it allowed them to do something that was inside that was safe that was generally free of outside germs and something they could do in the time that they were together and again at this point in time um this young man has grown up to be a pretty great baker um so it's interesting to think about how you kind of influence some of the activities that kids do when there's somebody in the household who's sick and i think you teach children some really important lessons about supporting people um, who are facing an illness, because invariably in life, most people will face an illness at one point or another. Well, and by by having these important conversations, um, you're giving your child the ability to have their own elevator speech, so to speak, when they go to school and someone asks them what's happening what's happening in your house? What's going on with your loved one? Why Why doesn't your mom have hair? It gives your child the ability to have mastery over that sentence and to really own and be able to, with confidence, um, share what's going on. Even if it's a, a situation where someone says, my dad told me that your dad said, and we saw it on Facebook, and that can be really empowering for your child to have the answers and to be able to say with confidence, no, this is what's going on. And, um, but it's really important to have had those conversations to um, give them the space to create that for themselves. Especially when it becomes your child's a teenager or even a little bit older, because Nancy had mentioned earlier all of the kids as early as they can are online looking and um there's so much misinformation out there and the information that is out there is really hard to understand and um we want to be able to give them the tools to navigate whatever they're reading but also to be able to come to you or someone else that you trust to ask is this real is this right? Is this what's really happening? Um, There's an important message. I mean, not in just what you said, but you brought up something. You brought up social media, which is a really big part of the current world. And if we could give you any advice today, one piece of advice would be to never post on social media of any kind, on Facebook, on Instagram, anywhere, anything that you have not communicated to your child because for children to learn information on social media about their own family and their own family's cancer journey is something that infuriates children. It makes them feel like they're not a valued member of the family. It makes them feel like they can't trust anybody. 
And there really is that feeling. How could you tell the world before you tell me? So thinking about the focus to keep within a family. And it's interesting to think how young that starts. You know, and you know your, the, your own children in your household and you know what they have access to, but you don't know what they have access to in other places. And as Tracy pointed out, you don't know what kids at school are saying to them. School is a really important part of the world of children of all ages and being able to inform the school and being the person who informs the school to give them clear and accurate information that is consistent with the information that your child has is really, really helpful and important. And when you think about through this whole process, whether your life course with cancer is that you are going to be a long-term survivor or that your cancer journey will bring you to the end of your life, it becomes important to think about the relationship you have with your child, the trust your child has with you, the love and admiration and respect you have for each other, because all of those themes play out during the cancer journey. So the more that you can be ahead of being the person who directs honest communication, dealing with issues that may be relevant. And, you know, and the issue may be, as Tracy pointed out, that somebody else's parent has something and had, you know, a devastating result. Well, that may not be your journey, but because it's in your child's framework of their own illness journey and the experience of somebody else, you have to know that they're going to be comparing um, those situations. Also, um, when you think about if you have multiple children in your household who are at all different ages, so they understand things differently, you have to think about how you will communicate information. And it becomes important to not burden children with some of the decisions and some of the information and some of the things you're thinking about or about taking care of other children in the family. If you think about that as a parent, it remains your role to be the person that figures out how to help all of the kids in the family to understand and digest this information. And that um, when you're delegating responsibilities and different things, it's really fine to delegate who's making breakfast and who's going to the zoo and who's, you know, taking care of the laundry and the meals. But some of the information, it becomes really important to come from you so that there's a feeling of direct communication and your value in the family, um, you know, as a child, that it's just a very important piece. Like communication is one of the main keys to how people will do as a result of this experience. Um, well, what are some of the tools, some of the real concrete things out there that people can use um, to help them navigate this? I mean, one of the things I'm thinking about is bibliotherapy or, or art, but what are what are some of the tools um, that of communication that you've used and see that you find really helpful? Well, I think that the use of books is really helpful in that because we live in a world where you can Google search something and find a book for the most part on it is that like reading a book with a child about somebody else's cancer journey is a really, really helpful thing, both because it gives the child context and some of the language around cancer and some ideas on what the cancer journey is. And then it allows you as a parent to also not have to be recreating the wheel, right? Like the last thing you want to have to do is figure out, oh, what's the best way to explain this or how do I do this? So that to ask the professionals you're involved with, you know, what books specific to some of the situations you're going through, whether it is hair loss, whether it's chemotherapy, radiation, there are books on all of those topics and they're really, really helpful to have in one's home library so that you can have them there for either a child who can read on their own to read them, to read with them, even for a child who reads on their own to, to read it with them and to look for literature that actually matches the situation you're in. 
you know, if that means that you were at the beginning, um, if you've had a relapse, if you, you know, have had a bone marrow transplant, like depending on what your specific situation is. So I think that um, that's one of the things. Also, many, many cancer organizations have downloadable kind of like art projects or activity pages or different things like that. And then there are things that, you know, like are unique to your child's house, you know, your child, your household. So if you have a child who's really into liking to play things out and dramatic play, um, it's fun to get puppets that like depict all the medical professionals so that, uh, that you know, and you can actually get um, toys that are made to look like cells. So you could, you could create like a medical toy box and even like a doctor's kit and allow younger children in particular to kind of play out their experience. And again, it's fascinating to see what you learn from children when they when they do that. For kids who are a little bit older, you know, actually keeping a journal is an, an interesting thing. Um, I had a lot of families who have like, like a child will write something in the journal at some point during the day, and then the parent will read the journal at night and respond to the child's um, thing and like kind of like you leave the journal a particular place where each person can find it and it might be for some people that's easier than sitting down and talking about things and then it becomes a valuable memory of what the treatment course was as well and what the communication was so it's a very it's a it's a very sweet idea that kind of enhances communication but it's also you know like sometimes you can decide that cancer um is something that changes the balance in your family it makes things unequal it feels like you have to deal with things that other families don't have to to um to to think about so trying to create that feeling in your household that things may not be as you want them to be but that your family is going to try to make the experience in a way as fair as it can be and as comforting as it can be, and that maybe you're going to develop new patterns and new activities. So maybe there's some things you can't do, there's some losses, but maybe there's some things you can do and there are some gains. And it it makes sense to engage kids in activities of like, what do they want to see, you know, happening during that time? Or if you have to have a few days in the hospital, where do they want to go? Sometimes children think, when they're sent off somewhere else, that that means that you don't care about them as much or that they've been displaced. So for a parent, they might think, oh, I created this great plan. But for the child, they might have preferred, you know, staying at home from school and being with a particular relative or a particular friend. And you can't always work those things out. But the more you give children choices and voices, in what's going on, the better they adapt to the situation. And in some ways, the happier they are. And that means the happier um, you will be. So, I mean, I, I think that, you know, we also live in a world that if you Google search, how do you explain cancer to a child? Or what activities would be good for dealing with chemotherapy? Or that you will find thousands of answers to those questions. And I think that the other thing that we want you to be sure of is that we are also available for right. emails and contact around these issues. These are things that we talk about all the time. And you might have a situation that happens in your household that is unique. And we might be able to tell you, oh, we've heard this before, you know, and this is what somebody else did in this situation. So that's something that we want you to know, um, you know, again, that that we are reachable um, and here for guidance not because we are the experts just because we've had the experience of having other people share information with us and let us know like kind of what has happened in their household you're not alone in this i think that's what we're saying and if we can help we want to be available so feel free to reach out to us at ocra and we'll we'll be in touch. I hope this information was helpful. And we look forward to speaking again. Thank, Thank you. you.